I'm Chichi Rodriguez right here at my home at Windermere. And as golfers, we're not all machines. When you're not a machine, you will hit the ball into trouble. Arnold Palmer does it, Jack Nicholas does it, Fuzzy Zeller does it, Lee Trevino does it, and I do it. But most of all, most of you do it more often than we do. So what I like to teach you is how to come out of trouble. I'm also going to show you some trick shots today so we can have some fun. So let's go do it. Before I play a round of golf, I prepare myself mentally and physically. Why? Because if I'm prepared mentally, I'm going to have a good attitude. And if I prepare myself physically, I will not pull a muscle. I try to play every shot in my mind before I go to the golf course. That gives me a very positive attitude. When you have a positive attitude, you think well, you think positive. I try to get up very slowly in the morning. I try to drive my car very slowly to the golf course. I try to walk to the driving range very slowly. That slows down my tempo. And it makes me swing much slower and much better. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is I stretch. When you do stretching exercises, you're not gonna pull a muscle when you're swinging. I also lift a lot of weight. And I recommend for you to go ahead and practice a lot. That way you make yourself a game plan. When you have a game plan, you're gonna have a better day. Today, we're gonna talk about how to get in and out of trouble. And you talk about being in trouble. I was playing one time with Homero Blancas. We were playing the Masters in Augusta, Georgia. The very last hole, Homero hit the slice, and the people were sitting there, and this lady was sitting down, and the ball came over and fell right on her brow, right under her blouse. Homero called me over. He wanted a ruling. He said, Chichi, what do I do? I said, play it. <laughs> well, he didn't want to play it. He just, he just wanted to talk about it. But if you want to stay out of trouble, there's some certain basic things that you must follow. I follow six basics in golf. I have, first of all, the grip, ball alignment, posture, ball position, backswing, and follow through. Those are the six basics about the game. There's four types of grips that you can use. I use the overlapping grip. With the overlapping grip, what I do is I, I always put my thumb, with all the grips, you should always put your thumb on your left hand on top of the club because that is what holds the club at the top of your backswing. Now, I put my little pinky on top of my forefinger on my left hand when I do grip. Now, if I'm gonna put any pressure at all in the fingers, I make sure that I grip the club like it's a bird and I have him in my hands, and I don't want to hurt him, but I don't want him to fly away. I don't grip the club very hard. But if I'm going to put any pressure at all, I'll do it with the three fingers, and I'll do it with the, the, the middle finger and the ring finger in your right hand. Don't put any other pressure with any other one of your fingers. That is the overlapping grip. Then you have the bottom grip, which is almost the same. All you do is take the pinky and drop it between the forefinger and the middle finger in your left hand. That's all you do different. Then you have the interlocking grip, which is the one that the great Jack Nicholas used all his life. Jack gripped the club like that. That is the interlocking. You see, instead of having the, the pinky on top, you interlock it like that. Then you have the baseball grip, which is the one that made our wall uh, a player. Our wall was, was, uh, was a great player always, but when he changed to the baseball grip, that's when he became a better player. He, he actually made this grip, the grip very famous. And Bob Rosberg got on it, and he played on it. He won the PGA. That's the 10 finger grip. You put every finger on the club. Any one of these grips might be good for you, 
But if you try one of them and it's not working just right for you, what you should do is go and see your PGA Pro and he will tell you which grip is better for you. Then you have ball position. The ball with the driver especially, the ball should always be placed right off your left heel. Why? Because when you grip the, the driver, the driver is the club that you want the maximum distance with. You want to catch the ball at the upswing. Also, when you have the ball on that left heel, what happens is your left arm, your left shoulder, and your club become a unit. As you can see, that whole thing is a unit. See? Now, what you do if you're going to hit an iron now, if we're going to hit an iron, we've got to move the ball back. Any club shorter, or the higher the number in a club, the more back you want to move the ball. Now, let's say that we want to hit a five iron. Five iron, right here we got it. What we do is we take that ball, and the ball moves back in your stand. As you can see, the ball is now, instead of on my left heel where the driver was, the ball is almost off the middle of my feet. Now, what happens is my hands are ahead of the club head. What this will help me do is going to help me hit down into the ball and, of course, hit the ball straighter because with the irons, when you hit the, down into the ball, the ball goes straighter and you put more backspin on it. Now, if you're going to hit a wedge, the wedge, I really move back. As you can see, I got the ball back of the middle of my stance. I put my hands forward more than, than with the five iron and I really hit down with this club and then we create a lot of backspin and it'll give you good direction. The ball will stop real good for you, and it'll better your score. That is very, very important to remember, the ball position. Third, I have the posture. When they tell you to bend your knees, they don't tell you to collapse your knees, eh? Just kind of flex your knees. Put the spine, your spine around your back as straight as you can, see? Stand with your shoulders back. Don John is he's an artist, he's standing up. I think he stands up better at the golf ball than anybody in the world. Uh, when they tell you that your feet should be the same width as your shoulders, I don't believe in that. I believe that a Zuma wrestler put his feet very far apart for one reason. I think that they have a better foundation. They are stronger. If you take a weightlifter, the weightlifters always have their feet wider than their shoulders to get more power. Then we have the alignment. When you align a golf ball, you should put your shoulders slightly left of the target, your hips should be slightly left of the target, and your feet should be straight at the target. What this will make you do, it will make you do the other basic, which is start, start the club straight back. And if you take the, the club straight back and you follow through, you have hit a good, great shot. Now, if you follow these six basics, your scores are going to get better and better and better. One of the ways to improve your game is to have more power, to hit the ball longer. But what causes power? See, mostly everything in life is a theory. My theory is that mass plus speed create power. Now, if I have a club that weighs 13 and a half ounces and the swing weight is D2, and I swing the club about 120 miles an hour, I should be able to hit the golf ball about 265, 270 yards. But how do you get that speed? See, speed is created by movement, and the movement must be done with rhythm. The worst mistake that you make is that when you stand at the ball, you lay the club down, and then here you are. You have no movement at all. Now, you must have the movement to create the rhythm. If you take the great Jack Nicklaus, here's how Jack Nicklaus stands right here, and he looks at the target, and he starts creating rhythm with his head. Jack Nicholas starts moving his head when he's standing right there. Then he kind of sneak up on the ball. If you see the way Jack sneaks up on the ball, that's the way he does it. And he's always moving. He's all, see, because golf, the golf swing is like shooting pull. When you shoot pull to create rhythm, you must put, move the pull cue, then you shoot. You don't shoot from a still position. Now, the same principle happens with golf. Now, if you take Tom Watson, for example, Tom Watson, there he goes. That's the way he waggles. If you take Fuzzy Seller, that's the way he waggles, see? And what I recommend for you to do is 
not let the club rest behind the ball. If you take me, for example, here I am, my club is moving or my feet are moving, something is always moving, then I go back and I hit the ball. For the little guy to hit the ball further, what I recommend for you to do is to lift those weights so that your forearms can get very strong to get a very, very wide open stance and to get a club that is a little longer because we little guys don't have as much leverage. So I recommend for you to get you maybe a 43 and 3 quarter driver or maybe a 44 inch driver that weighs about these three, not too stiff a shaft. This will give you more club speed and the more club speed you have, the further you're gonna hit the ball and this will really improve, improve your game because it's easier when you're hitting wedges to the green than when you're hitting, hitting eight irons. So hit the ball longer and enjoy yourself. If you can follow my basics, you'll improve your game. If you don't, you may find yourself in trouble right from the start. Trouble shots, they start right on the tee. And how do you get into trouble? You get into trouble by slicing too much or hooking too much. Now, what causes a hook and what causes a slice? Let's show you the proper way on how to hit a straight shot. If you strike the ball from 6 o'clock to 12 o'clock, you will have a very, very straight shot. What causes a slice? You take the club on the outside, and then you come over the top, and you can see that the club goes across parallel, and you strike the ball at 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock, and that is what makes the ball slide. If you strike it from 5 to 11 o'clock, that is what makes the ball slide. What causes a hook? The club goes too far inside, and as you can see at the top of the back swing, the club is gonna be too flat. Then you're gonna strike the ball at seven o'clock to one o'clock, and that is what makes the ball hook. If you strike it from seven o'clock to one o'clock, the ball is gonna hook. Now I'm gonna try and hit a, a straight shot here. Here we go. Oh, but I hooked it. That's terrible, now I'm really in trouble. But I know how to get out of there. So if I know how to get out of trouble, my game is always gonna be good. You do the same. What a terrible lie. Arnold Palmer wouldn't have a lie like that. You talk about Arnold Palmer, how great that man really is. In 1962, I was playing the Denver Open. I came to the guard house, and the man says, do you have an identification? This is a policeman now. I say, sir, I'm Chichi Rodriguez, the golf pro. He says to me, you have an identification. I says, sir, I'm Chichi Rodriguez, the golf pro. He says, you have an identification. I say, sir, I lied. I'm not Chichi Rodriguez, the pro. I'm Arnold Palmer's caddy. And he said, well, go on in. <laughs> now I lie like this. Don't try to be a hero out of here to start with. What you want to make sure you do here is you hit a nice shot where you can get into position of reaching the green on your next shot because then maybe you can make a par. Now, when I have a situation like this, a terrible light like this, the first thing I do is I look around to see if I have to stand on a golfer hole or stand on a fire ant hill or maybe the ball is in there in a fire ant hill. If that is a fact, then you would get a free drop. Here's the appropriate USGA rule for this situation. See, the rules of golf were made to help you, not to hurt you. Now, actually, if this was an ant hill here, I would take a complete stand relief out of there, and then I would get a club length from there, which would give me a clear shot at the green. Now, these limbs here, it's illegal to 
push the limbs with your hands. You can't use your hands to better your life. But with your feet and your body, you can actually see what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take my head and put it under, because this is the only way I can hit the ball. I'm not doing this to, uh, to improve my life or anything, but I'm entitled to it. And I don't mind getting what I'm entitled to. That's what we're all, that's what, uh, what America is all about. We get what we're entitled to. So now this limb has gone back. I step on this little limb here, and here I go. And I'm going to try and hit this ball so I reach the green on my next shot. And here we go. I got it out. Now I can reach the green and I can make a nice bar. Now here's another terrible lie. Now why is a terrible lie? It's because this limb is on your way. Now most of you, your problem here is that you stand too straight. In a shot like this, I always felt the same way as if I was in a fire. If I'm in a fire in a building, I'm not going to run. I'm going to stand in the middle of that building, and I'm going to think. But I don't want to hit it left-handed. I'm going to still keep on checking which way I'm going to hit the shot. Now here, I have found a way to do it. The loft of the club is going to decrease as I take the club back inside. So if I took, say, a seven iron, the seven iron would be like a three iron here, and I would hit the ball too low, I would probably fan it and leave it there. Now I'm gonna put my left hand very strong, very strong position. I'm gonna grip it with a real hook grip here where I can see four knuckles in my left hand when I look. This will also help me take the club back inside this way. I'll take the club back inside and, and let's see what happens here. There, I have hit the ball about 100 yards, and now I got a real good chance of making my par. Now here we have two kinds of situations in the rough. One is a terrible lie, one is a good lie. The good lie, you go ahead and hit it just the same as if you were in the fairway. That's a very, very easy shot. Now the bad lie, the worst that you can do here is to use a long iron. Suppose that you had 175 yards to go. Now, why is bad to use a long iron? I'll show you why. Because if you take this iron and you go through this grass like that, there's too much resistance. Now, you take a wood and you do the same thing and it goes freely through. Why? Because the wood is wider on the bottom than the iron. So, there's a lot of people that are very strong. They can take Jack Nicholas, for example. He used to could take a, a four iron from a lie like that and hit it 220 yards. But we, the, the, the guy that is not as strong as Jack, we got to find a way to do it. I take the four wood. I will not use the long iron. I aim an inch behind the ball. This, don't try to hit the ball. If you try to hit the ball clean, what's going to happen is you're going to tap it, the ball is going to go between 35, 40, 50 feet. That's all it's going to go. So go ahead and aim an inch behind this ball and hit an inch behind, follow through. The ball will come out 175 yards. Now, if you do this, you will improve your game and your strokes are going to be going down in your score. Now, if you get caught in a situation like this, Tell them what your options are. First of all, I'm going to try and hit this ball that way. 
Now, I see that I can just about hit this ball about maybe 20, 25 feet from here. I, that, that wouldn't be advancing it very, very much. Now, I'll study this option here. Now, I see where I can probably hit a 50 yard from there. Now, we're going to study this other situation. And uh, no way I can hit it that way. Now, me being me, I think what I would do is I would probably go ahead and hit this ball left-handed. Now, I'm going to use the pitching wedge or the sand wedge simply because they're bigger. You see that these clubs are bigger. They're more wide than any other clubs in your bag. So you, you'll have more room on the club to hit this ball with. So now here we go. That was a good shot. Now, I have a chance of making my part, maybe even a birdie. Here we have a shot out of the hard pan. But how do you play a hard pan shot? Actually, what I do is I, I want to make sure that I don't hurt myself uh, when I hit the shot. Now, you never know what's underneath this ball. It might be a rock, there might be a root. So, what I do is instead of playing the, suppose that I'm going to hit the wedge here, first of all. Every club should be struck the same. You should try and pick the ball clean because you won't hurt yourself if you pick this ball clean. If you hit down into the ball, chances are you might hurt your wrist. So I play my normal wedge shot. I move the ball back behind my, the middle of my feet, as you can see, and I put my hands forward. I hit down into the ball. But in this particular shot, I do the complete opposite. I move the ball forward, and I put my hands back. Now they're level with the club head. My hands are level with the club head. I pick the ball clean. And when you pick the ball clean here, like that, oh, that was a good shot. You will never hurt your wrist. In this situation here, here's a shot that we might make a high score if we gamble and go through those trees. Now, what I recommend and what I would do here myself is pitch the ball out in the fairway so I don't get a high score. Because if you hit one of those trees, you try and go through there, you hit one of those trees, and the ball come back and hit you. Now you got a two-shot penalty. And the ball might hit that tree and might go unplayable in another place. So I'll take this shot here, and I'll put it back in the fairway. See, to me, golf has always been a sport that you play with 50% courage and 50% intelligence. But in this particular instance, this particular shot, I'm going to use 100% intelligence. If you think like that, you're thinking like a champion. When you hit the ball into trouble, sometimes you end up in very peculiar places. I'm in a very peculiar place right here, right now. And the problem that I face is that I have all these loose impediments around my ball. Now, I have to make sure that when I move those loose impediments, I don't move the ball. Because if the ball moves, you have a penalty coming. And since golf is a gentleman's game, it doesn't make any difference if somebody's seen you or not. You're supposed to call the penalty against yourself. Now, this twig here is on my way, so it's very safe for me to take it out, to remove it. Now, my ball has a move. Now, I'm going to try and move this one here, this cone, without moving the ball. Now, the ball doesn't look very stable, but I did get it out. The ball didn't move. Now, if I try to move this twig here, the ball will move. So I think I'm better off leaving that twig alone. And what I'm going to do here when I'm going to hit the shot is I'm not going to ground the club, because if you ground the club, look what happens. Now the ball moves. When the ball moves, you got a penalty coming. So I keep the club up in the air like Jack Nicklaus. Jack Nicklaus has never, ever grounded his club when he played golf. 
And sometimes that's good not to ground the club because if you haven't ground the club and the ball moves, it's no penalty. So unless you have picked some impediments, other loose impediments around the ball. Now, anytime the ball moves then, you have cost it to move, so that's a penalty. So now here we go. Uh, what I do is I go ahead and hit the whole twig, and I hit a good shot. The rules of golf were made to help you. So if you follow the rules, you will play better golf, and you will never have to explain anything. Play by the rules, live by the rules, you'll be a champion when you do that. Here I have a situation where I'm supposed to hit this ball from here that way. Now, I remember in 1985, I was playing with Johnny Miller at Hilton Head, Harbor Town. At the 17th hole, Johnny Miller hit the ball against the fence on the left. Actually, it was a pole there. 